Okay. Um, we use this term behavioral health, and I did want to talk for just a second about what behavioral health is, um, and, and particularly behavioral health versus mental health. These are two different sorts of phrases and terminologies. When you, when you look up the definition of behavioral health, what you find is that behavioral health is intended to be an interdisciplinary field dedicated to promoting a philosophy of health that stresses individual responsibility in the application of behavioral and biomedical science knowledge, and so on and so forth, okay? This is a little bit different, um, and there's actually a fair amount of controversy online that, for example, the Collaborative Family Healthcare Association um, has sort of an ongoing discussion of the use of mental health versus behavioral health and what they individually mean, that one of them has more of a disease uh, implication while another has more of an individual responsibility or holistic sort of implication. For the most part, these two terms tend to be used interchangeably, um, especially in educational environments. Why is it important? Let's, let's talk about that, and this is where I'd like to get you guys involved. Why is it important to have discussion of behavioral health topics in educational environments. Go. Well, it impacts their education. It impacts all parts of their lives. Okay. Um, large numbers of students are impacted, um, and we know that it impacts them in a variety of ways, and these are some of the ways. We know that students with behavioral health disorders have greater absences. They have greater truancy. Um, it has a dramatic impact on their performance, but also their behavior in the classroom setting. We also know that unfortunately only about half of children and teens who have behavioral health disorders will ever receive professional treatment for them. And so that means that we are going to be dealing with these issues on an ongoing basis for a long time in our educational environments. So it behooves us to be as knowledgeable as possible about how that's going to play out. When you look at statistics, I mean, Studies range a little bit, but there are some pretty good meta-analysis studies that look at the prevalence of behavioral health disorders among student populations. One of the most recent indicates that when you look at students from 8 to 15 years of age, 13% of them met a criteria for a behavioral, disor behavioral health disorder within that past year. So we're not talking ever, we're not talking lifetime experience, we're just talking within that past year, 13% of them. So, uh, you know, more than, um, more students than we would think are, are dealing with this. And this is kind of how it broke down in that study. The largest number of them are dealing with ADHD in one of its forms. 4% um, approximately dealing with some form of depression, 2.1% a conduct disorder, anxiety and eating disorders within that particular age group, a little bit less. When you factor in older students, you start to see a little bit more of that anxiety emerging. But these are pretty significant numbers. This is some more from the National Comorbidity Study, which indicated that if you start to look lifetime, and again, they're just looking at young people, so when we say lifetime, we mean over, the li or the, over their educational life. 11% um, of them will have uh, mood disorder symptoms, 10% a behavior disorder of some sort, and 8% um, an anxiety disorder. So um, those are pretty good numbers. Even in our smaller schools, that means we're going to be dealing with a lot of kids. There's also some variability. Some of you are, are more early education, some of you middle school, some of you primary, some of you high school. We do see a little bit of variability in what kinds of disorders we're, we're dealing with based on the age of our students. Mood disorders tend to occur by age 13. The behavioral disorders tend to occur by age 11 but often very much younger. So for example, many of the students who will end up diagnosed with ADHD, it's already very uh, apparent <laughs> um, in their preschool environments. Substance abuse disorders tend to emerge by age 15, and anxiety disorders by age six, but they peak in high school. To complicate things even more, of those students who have one disorder, 40% of them have a comorbidity, have a coexisting disorder of some sort. So that might be ADHD, but they develop depression. That might be depression, but they develop a substance abuse disorder. It can take all sorts of forms. Suicide is always something that we have to be very concerned about when we're dealing with populations of students who have behavioral health concerns. And the stats on that are pretty alarming. In 2013, um, they did a large uh, survey of students, and they found that 17% of students, 
17% had seriously considered suicide, had significant suicidal ideation. 13.6% of those had made a plan. And for those of you who are in the mental health field, you know this is how we, how this is the sort of the tiered way that we look at risk, right? Um, it is not uncommon, unfortunately, for us as human beings to have fleeting thoughts of suicide or to have passive, what we call passive thoughts of suicide, which is, boy, I wonder what would happen if I didn't wake up tomorrow. Things are really stressful, it'd just be easier not to have to deal with it. Those are the passive thoughts. Then you have sort of active suicidal ideation. I wish I could kill myself or I want to kill myself. And then you have the plan. Because when people have gone so far in their thinking that they have developed a plan of how they're going to make that happen, that's a high-risk situation. And 14% of kids had made a plan. 8% of students had attempted, and 2.7% had attempted with harm, which means some lasting medical complication, either an injury from a knife or a gunshot wound or some medical complication from, from pills taken in overdose. How many of you have worked with students who have attempted suicide? Why? Okay, so, so the statistics tell us that these behavioral health issues um, are prevalent, they are frequent, they are a huge problem. Why? Why so much of a problem? When you look at um, most of the models for how behavioral health disorders develop, um, there are a number of factors that are at play. We know that most of the major mental health or behavioral health disorders have a fairly strong genetic component. So when we look at family history of someone with a, a severe depression or bipolar disorder, it's not uncommon to find a first degree relative or two or three with uh, the same disorder or a variant of it. So genetics absolutely plays a role. Genetics by itself is not enough. Um, there is, uh, how many of you know about the diathesis stress model? Um, the diathesis stress model says that whether or not someone develops a mental health or behavioral health disorder um, depends on how these factors weigh together, okay? If I had a little, if I had something to draw with, what I would draw is I would draw um, a picture of a glass, okay? And in order for a person to develop the behavioral health or the mental health disorder, we have to reach the rim of the glass, okay? And genetics pours into that glass and fills it up to a certain level. And then life stressors um, in the environment, in the school setting, in the home setting, fill it the rest of the way up. So what we know is that kids with a fairly limited or even no real significant genetics, it fills it up this much. But if they experience enough environmental stress or life stress or interpersonal stress, they can still get all the way there, even with a very small genetic loading. Conversely, students who have a pretty significant genetic loading already, a pretty strong family history, it's not going to take as much of that environmental stress. They're more vulnerable because of that. Does that make sense? To push it over the edge to overflow and have that student experiencing um, a significant mental health disorder. And this is true. Um, not for every single thing we're going to be discussing. ADHD is a little bit of a different animal, um, but it's certainly true for depression, it's true for anxiety, it's true for self-injury, it's true for conduct problems like oppositional defiant disorder, um, conduct disorder, and so forth. And then you look at other life stress. So family stress would, would be things like parenting, uh, parent availability, um, parent support, parent affection, whether there's abuse or neglect or parent substance abuse problems or parent mental illness that affects their ability to parent effectively. And then you have other life stress as well. So that's where you get the relationship stress, you get the bullying issues, you get school performance stress, all of those things as well. Um, and then vulnerability factors will also play into that. Um, and what I mean by vulnerability factors is students um, are wired different ways. So you will have noticed that some of your students seem more sensitive than others. Um, some of your students are more prone to um, being sort of worriers or being anxious. And those kind of vulnerability factors will also play a role. So all of this together creates a picture of why we see so much uh, behavioral health and mental health concern. Um, the other thing that complica complicates it is just the youth of the population that we're dealing with. 
Um, I joked earlier about frontal lobe development, and it's absolutely true. Studies show now the frontal lobe, and we'll talk about it a little later on because it's very important in ADHD, but the frontal lobe of your brain is a part of your brain that controls executive functioning. So it's sort of driving the bus. Um, Russell Barkley, who is a, a, a leading sort of researcher in ADHD, compares it to the conductor of an orchestra. So you can have an orchestra where all of the members of the orchestra are highly trained and all the instruments are perfectly tuned, but if your conductor sucks, it's not going to sound good. And that's that frontal lobe. So it's what puts into play everything else that you know. And the reality of the situation is that even among typically developing youth, the frontal lobe is not fully developed until in your 20s, typically. And for men, it's, it's longer. So, no offense. <laughs> yeah, let's do. Let's take a little break, stretch our legs, get a drink, and then we'll dive into some of the content re regarding um, common behavioral health problems.